Welcome back for another week of Garage Time. Paint prep continues this week, I know, big surprise, but of course there will be a diversion from sanding. Garage Time. Okay, at the end of last week's video, I promised I would come out and do some sanding. Well, that didn't happen, but let me show you what I did do. Okay, now that the hood seal is in place and everything is lined up really well, I need to latch it down. So I put the latch in and I have it working now. I'm gonna talk you through some of the steps I did, but let me show you inside. First of all, I have a little pull wire here so I can actuate the latch without having to go inside. So I can undo the latch, lift the hood up, and then I can undo the clasp and pick it up. There are a few problems. If you're familiar with backdates, you'll know that the latch is always a problem. And there's, there's two problems. One, I decided not to use the gas struts to lift the hood up. And the extra weight here on the front of the hood makes it so that when you pull the release, the hood does not pop up on its own. The, the weight of the hood is just too heavy. The other issue is once it's released, you have to reach in to undo the catch. So this is not gonna blow up in the wind. It's secure and it has the factory catch. But to release the catch, you have to come in, um, one hand lifting the hood and the second hand to release the catch. This is gonna be really difficult to do once the bumper's in place. So I have plans on modifying the latch. The upper latch just needs to be modified a little bit. And that would be a great diversion, but I'm not gonna do it this week. I'm gonna come back once the car's painted. This will be a project for another day. Adjusting this latch wasn't too difficult. Um, it was really helpful to have the gas tank removed because I can go inside from underneath the car and visualize the alignment of you know, the clasps and the pins and making sure everything fits well. Basically, I just kept the bolts loose and uh, closed the hood, put everything uh, together and then tightened the bolts. Okay, I also have this door set up with the rubber and latches in place. So this closes as it will in the car. And then I adjusted right here, I adjusted this down just a little bit. Um, I took the washer out, so now everything is completely flush. Across the, um, the hood to the cowl and the hood to the fender, this is all very flush right here. I'll show you up close in a minute. And then this is my gap checker tool. If you remember from uh, way back when, when I was redoing all these gaps, um, this is basically a paint stick, but I have a three millimeter gap um, right everywhere you go. A little bit of um, fillers in here, so this will, this will clear out. Here's this whole corner. Um, I did tap this piece down. This is ready for additional filler and primer. Um, this corner here, I just, like I said, reduced the uh, washer stack on the back. It's about you know, a half a millimeter washer in there now. And these gaps are also uh, within reason. This one here is actually a little bit tight. I could space the fender out a little bit more. There's a rubber gasket that goes in between here. So I think when that rubber gasket comes in, it's gonna push this right where it needs to be. It's just a little bit tight. That's probably um, two and a half millimeters. I'm trying for three and a half millimeters before it gets the final paint. Three millimeters after paint. I've also drilled some uh, reference holes or witness holes on the fenders relative to the tub. So just like I did on the hood hinges, I now have some holes in strategic places so that if I do and when I do take the uh, fenders back off, it's gonna be really easy to realign. So after all the sanding is done and everything is level from panel to panel, I don't want to have to guess where the panels go. Okay, this side of the car is the same situation. I have everything fitting very level across the uh, cowl to hood area. I've drilled some reference marks into the uh, alignment panel, but everywhere I look, these are all very flush. So this is ready for some sanding and um, some filling. And I've also included the rubber seal and the latch on this door. So the rubber seal is in place. This is the original seal have some stiffness left to it so it's going to be the one I'm going to use. Okay here's another look at the rubber seal and this is the striker plate that is um, adjusted 
Uh, and I have some temporary hardware in here. You can see I've just found some random bolts and things. That's so not the right hardware. But I'm showing you this because I did have to make some spacer plates so that the latch, um, the, the portion that goes in here, didn't rub against this side of the latch. Okay, my advice to you if you're doing this procedure of adjusting the doors and the latch, now that the rubber's in place, I'm putting the latch in last. And I don't use the latch to adjust anything. It's only there to keep the door closed. I mean, that's why they call it a latch. It's not really there to adjust body gaps. It does control the pressure that the seal is under, so kind of this distance has to be correct. And of course, it shouldn't alter the position of the door. But the door is really held in place by the hinges. And all I did, like I did in the front hood, is I loosened the bolts, I closed it, I tightened the bolts, and I'm done. I don't want the, the latch to be uh, a convoluted um, system of trying to maintain gaps. It really basically just holds the door in place. So, so my advice is uh, basically it's all in the hinges. Make sure your hinges are tight, make sure your hinges are adjusted well, and make sure the shape of the door actually fits the car. That's a metalworking exercise. That is not something that the latch is gonna solve for you. So um, that's why uh, that time I spent early on is really paying off now. Things are fitting as good as they were before with the rubber in place and the latch in place. So it's really there to just close the door. So now it's time for some sanding. Okay, so prior to block sanding, it's important to have the door and the panels in the correct place. So this is the position they're gonna be in when the car is finished. That is with the factory latches, the factory rubber, Everything that really controls the gaps in the, in the, uh, the elevations across the gaps is really in place. I have the green light now to go back and do some more sanding. Wait, I'm gonna need to get some caffeine first. Okay, it feels like I've been sanding for hours and I did get a little bit done. I got some work done on the cowl area and the hood and the uh, driver's fender and it's, it's coming out okay, but I am ready for a diversion. One of the big remaining obstacles preventing me from finishing this paint job is the roll cage. Now I have decided to do a half cage in the rear only and I wanted to do two things. One is for safety and two, it's to strengthen the car, strengthen the chassis. So um, the rear roll cage can help in torsional rigidity and overall um, chassis flex. So that's what I'm gonna work on now. Let me show you inside. Talk about a mess. Inside here is just a kind of stockpile of parts I've taken off and extra pieces. So I need to uh, get the vacuum, kind of clean this area out. And then we can talk about the planning for this, um, this roll cage. Okay, welcome to the inside of my Porsche 911 wreck. So the only thing we've done here so far um, on YouTube is, uh, you know, filled in those holes in the dash. There were some rectangular holes here and here. Um, I filled those in when I was doing all the trunk prep for the, uh, the epoxy primer there. Now, the thing that is uh, not here on YouTube, this was done prior to meeting all you guys. This whole corner over here was damaged in the wreck. You know, I don't have pictures or footage of that, but you just have to trust me that this floor area, which has already been fixed, was actually crinkled. There was wrinkles in the floor. This, um, I think it's the longitudinal or inner frame support. I'm not quite sure what this is called but you can see the shinier metal. Let me see if I can get my flashlight over there. This shinier metal right here is all been replaced. So you can see some welding done there. Those inner um, fenders have been, you know, removed and fixed and pulled and straightened and all that. So that's what's left. There's some evidence of repairs here, but it's done to a very high standard. Once this is painted, you will not know that this car was ever in a wreck both from the trunk area or inside here. Okay, so the idea with the roll cage is to attach it down here, um, right where the uh, chassis is, and then follow it up along the B pillar 
and I will probably put, be putting in some gusseting plates between the cage and the B pillar. So, you know, this is metal. Okay, in terms of roll cage design, I am not targeting any particular sanctioning body or race organization. I'm just trying to make a fun car, definitely a track car, but it's mostly kind of driver's education type events, autocross. There's specifications online, numerous ones. Uh, Mark Shepard, one of the subscribers here, has sent me a boatload of information, so I need to review that. But I think I have a good idea on the basics. So for the main hoop, has to be made of one continuous piece. It should be as close as possible to the roof. It should be um, as close as possible to the B pillars. The distance from the driver's head has to be at least three inches, but no more than like six inches. So basically there's lots of Porsche cages. Um, I'm gonna be mimicking those and improving them wherever I can. One of the other difficulties with this project is that I don't have a bender here in my shop. I do have access to it at the community workshop, but that means driving, you know, 15 minutes away every time I need to do a measurement or something like that. So it is a little bit problematic. Planning, of course, is going to be key. Okay, you gotta start somewhere. So um, I have this uh, little protractor, it's just a paper template. And I'm gonna take some measurements across the top to get the width right here at the B pillars. Yeah, I'm just using this, uh, this level, carpenter's level or uh, pocket level, and this protractor and uh, measuring the angle of this B pillar relative to the horizontal. Okay, 13 degrees, um, you know, leaning out. Okay, I'm mocking this up with three quarter inch um, electrical conduit. Now, obviously I'm not gonna be using anything like this for the actual material. Um, for this weight of car, it'll be less than 2,500 pounds. I believe inch and a half is the required diameter of tubing, but everything is based on the center line radius in the center of the tube. So I can mock it up with this and then put some, some cushion around it to understand you know, what the clearances are with the roof and so forth. This is what I'm using because it's easier to bend here in my garage. I can bend it with a uh, conduit bender. So, uh, you know, don't, I uh, hope I didn't lose you yet. This is just for mock-up. digital level. Oh, it was at 78 already. Yep, that was a good guess, 77. Okay, hopefully you can see it up there on the top comes along, it follows the pillar, and then it, it bends, um, but it's bent a little too far back, and from this view, it's not bent in enough. So clearly the angle that I was um, holding the uh, tube was, uh, was not correct. So I'm going to just try to, you know, push it in a little bit further and see if I can get a better fitment here. So now I have it attached here to the bottom of the car where it's the strongest. And then it, it kind of comes up vertical. And then right about where the quarter window begins, it bends towards the pillar. And then up along the roof, it's, I'm holding it here with my hand. But up along the roof, it's sitting horizontal. So that's a, about approximately what I want to do. Um, with that second bend I just put in, it's standing a little too tall. I need to cut the base a little bit. And then this bar kind of comes up, you know, it's somewhat vertical. And then right at the quarter window, it's dipping back. And I have some zip ties holding this in position so I can take uh, some video. I'm using this, this welding clamp to keep the tube here centered in the car. So of course I'm only doing, you know, one side. So this in the corner here should be almost touching. So right now in the corner, it's probably, this is probably inch and a half. Um, the actual diameter tube would make it three quarters of an inch. 
So, you know, as close as possible, but all I would have to do is, you know, make this cut a little bit longer. Depending on where the seat is, I may decide to shift this bend just down just a little bit more. Right now, it's, it's just about even with the, with the window, but um, I might shift it down just a little bit. I obviously don't want my shoulder anywhere near this um, corner, so maybe, maybe it is in a good place. And then the position of it from front to rear can also be shifted, and uh, that really comes into play with the, uh, the harness bar. The harness bar that comes across here needs to be pretty close to the seat. It doesn't need to be, you know, really far back. So the, the harness bar can have a bend in it, but the closer to the seat, the better. And then obviously up here, the danger with this is you don't want your head, especially if you're driving it without a helmet, you do not want your head to hit this. Here, this is how the bar looks as it currently sits right now. There's the zip tie kind of holding it in place. It's, it follows along this B pillar and then it takes a turn uh, right about where that blue tape is and it heads not straight down but uh, angled down towards the bottom. Here's another view from the rear window. The bar is close to the B pillar and then it's coming straight down right down to where it attaches the frame rail right there. Okay so the the future plans would be to tie these two together with a plate. So this is uh, pretty heavy duty steel right here so I can put a plate um, between here probably with some holes or even solid but that's going to really tie in the roof structure with the roll bar and i think that's going to provide extra torsional stiffness and also just stiffness in general but that'll be tested of course as i've done in the past i will measure torsional rigidity with the cage in place and try to determine you know what is the benefit of doing all these modifications if you haven't seen the video where I do that uh, testing relative to the strut bar or the seam welding, please click right here. I'll have it up on the screen. Okay, I know this doesn't look like much and this is not a roll cage, but I learned a lot forming it and putting it in the car and measuring it and following, seeing where things land. It's definitely good food for thought. I'm going to be doing more research on uh, the rules and other people's cars and also put the seat in to see sort of where my head falls relative to this bar Because I don't want to hit my head on the bar ever. This is just a straight angle here, but this one here bends um, Not only in but also bends back so you can see that is tricky So it's an angle in this direction angle in this direction So when it comes time to bending the real piece it is just going to involve you know, where do you position this probably bend this one first and then position this bend second so it's going to have an angle relative to the horizontal that we'll have to figure out but uh, so far this is a good start if you have any suggestions or any comments about roll cages please feel free to leave me a comment i know a lot of you guys have done this before i have not also if you enjoy these videos please don't forget to subscribe i've noticed that a lot of you haven't subscribed i don't know why it's a free thing to do, so it certainly helps out the channel, it helps out me, you know, keeps me motivated, and I'm trying to do that for you. All this content for you is free, subscribing is free, so please hit the button, hit the bell next to it, and you won't miss any future videos. And while I'm at it, don't forget, if you haven't already bought a Garage Time shirt, please do so. They are for sale in the link in the description below. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.